series this morning, Stewarding Life. I don't know that we got our handouts done this morning, uh, so if you want to take notes, if you've got a piece of paper, I don't know. Brother Paul, do we have any blank paper out there? If we don't, the, the handouts are in the office, they just didn't get copied this morning. Um, but you can take notes if you'd like this morning. We're talking about stewarding health today. Uh, what an appropriate subject. We just finished uh, Thanksgiving, so Brother Bob, we're going to talk about you know how to recover from that this morning. <laughs> See what the Bible says about overeating and gluttony. It's a good time of year to be talking about that, isn't it? Uh, I read the other day that the average American eats 13 pounds of turkey a year. Now, we typically eat turkey once or twice a year. And I don't eat 13 pounds. I mean, I eat quite a bit at Thanksgiving. So I don't know if that was taken into account like turkey lunch meat. I would hope that it does because if it doesn't, there's a lot of people out there that's at least making up for most of the people I know uh, having to make up that average for it to be 13 pounds a person. I didn't eat that much turkey on Thanksgiving. It has to be. Uh, I just, brother, brother Denny, did you eat 13 pounds of turkey on Thursday? I mean, that's like a, the average size of a turkey. I don't eat that much turkey in a year. I don't think I even ate eight ounces of turkey, maybe, maybe four ounces. It's just there's too many, too many things to eat at Thanksgiving just to eat that much of one, one item. Uh, but we're going to talk about stewarding health this morning uh, because our health, it's, it's foundational to our ability to steward all of the other resources that God has given to us. Stewarding our health uh, applies to every other part of our life. And so our physical and emotional strength are vehicles through which we can minister to others for the Lord. We got the handouts there. Uh, and so this morning, we'll see how the Bible outlines some practical help for us uh, for our uh, physical and emotional well-being. Uh, we have to realize that uh, healthy minds and healthy bodies uh, are to be used in the service of the Lord. We'll see that here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 in a moment. Uh, we'll recognize this morning that spiritual hunger for God's power is more important uh, than the filling of physical appetites. And then we'll talk about rest and replenishment. Stewarding health. January, you know, that's the time of year when everybody kind of gets on a health kick. They get ready, I guess, after eating all of their 13 pounds of turkey during the holidays. If it's, I'll have to look up and see how much ham the average person eats because if you eat 13 pounds of turkey plus ham, you need to be on that diet come New Year's. That must be why it's such a popular uh, time for diets. Uh, but as Christians, uh, we know that we belong to Christ. Lock, stock, and barrel. God owns us. Our bodies are his possession. The Bible says our bodies are his temple. And just like a temple is made for worship, our bodies are to bring honor and glory to Christ. Now, when we talk about health and we look at what most of the culture around us, when we, when we talk about health and getting healthy, uh, it's generally uh, kind of pandering to self-gratification. If you, you know, as you study health and things like that, uh, a lot of the popular diets and things that go around, it's for self-gratification, and it's good to be healthy. It's pleasurable, uh, pleasurable to be healthy. It feels good when you're healthy, uh, but we have to realize uh, that our bodies uh, do not belong to us. Our primary motivation in being healthy and stewarding our health is that we are to be responsible in using our bodies uh, in the service of Christ. Now, we talk about health, and sometimes you know people get a little nervous talking about health, and uh, so I thought, well, let's kind of get at ease about this, you know, so we can put everybody. At, at, at rest this morning thinking about uh, food and, and eating at this time of the year. So I read some of these things, and this made me feel better as I was reading about it. Looking about exercise, here's one of the things I read. 
One person wrote, every time I get the urge to exercise, I lie down until the feeling passes. That's a good motto. The second day of diet is always easier than the first. By the second day, you're off it. My doctor told me to stop having intimate dinners for four, unless there's three other people. Mm. Number one, the biblical paradigm for health. What, what, is, uh, what is the Bible example here that we see? Uh, scripture has a lot to say about the care of our bodies. And before we go to 1 Corinthians, let me read you a verse from uh, 3 John. From the book of 3 John, verse number 2, I want you to see what the Apostle John wrote here. He said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now, the Apostle John was writing uh, this, this letter to his uh, close friend, a man by the name of Gaius. And he's, he's, he wants him to enjoy the same robust health physically that he's already experienced and already possesses uh, spiritually. Now, we know spiritual health by far is the most important thing, isn't it? We want to be spiritually healthy. But physical health, to the power that we have within, you know, within ourselves to strengthen it, is important as well. And John wanted Gaius here in the book of 3rd John to be free uh, from the distraction of illness and pain so that he could best carry out the work that God had called him to do. And scripture is clear, as we'll see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 19, verse number 20. Scripture is clear that God's purpose for our bodies, for our physical bodies, is to use it for His honor and for His glory. And that's what we've been talking about now for, uh, this is our third week, as we talk about stewarding life, stewarding time, now stewarding health. All of this leads back to one central thing, that we're to steward our lives for God's honor and for God's glory, and our bodies are part of that. Uh, he didn't just claim our souls, did he? He purchased our bodies as well. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, verse 20, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And that's why the Apostle John wanted Gaius to have strong health, so that he could uh, have the strength uh, to expend his life in the service of God. And that's the ultimate reason that any of us should desire to have good health, to have long days. The longer that we're here on earth, the longer that we have to live out God's purpose, God's will in our lives. Isn't that true? That's, our, that's the purpose uh, for living a long life. Uh, if, it was, if it was just the fact, man, uh, the day that you got saved, if there was no other purpose in life, you might as well just go ahead and die then, shouldn't you? Because you'd be better off to be in heaven than to be here on earth. But God saved us and put us here on earth. Uh, and once we are his, once we have received that uh, redeeming blood of Jesus Christ to our lives... God gives us a divine purpose to continue living out. And there's, you know, there's many aspects of health and sickness that we don't understand. We probably never will. We don't know, you know, why loved ones develop cancer. Even ones who, who seemingly have lived a very healthy life, they've got all, and yet they'll, they'll develop cancer and they may die. We don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to us. We don't understand why, you know, many godly Christians may be uh, crippled in pain and deal with chronic, uh, chronic pain, chronic illness. We don't understand those things. But you know what we do know? Romans 8.28 is true. Amen? Romans 8.28 is true. It's in, it's in the Bible. And the all things, look at Romans 8.28 with me. Uh, and we know that all things... Now, those two words, all things that are referenced here, that would include sickness and health, wouldn't it? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So in God's sovereignty, he has, he has promised to work all things for our good and his eternal purposes. The illness that we may encounter in life, the, the disease, the sickness that we have, that we deal with, loved ones who deal with it, God says that he works those things for our good and for his purpose, for his glory. 
And although we wish that we could always enjoy continual health, as we discussed last week, uh, we'll spend uh, two or three or four years of our lives. The average person will spend that much time in their life dealing with illness. So we just understand that that's likely going to be a part of our lives uh, someday. But we recognize that in God's providence, He has a bigger purpose than sometimes we can see. And that's clear through all the pages of Scripture, isn't it? There are many times that God has a plan, God has a purpose for allowing certain events to happen that they didn't see or understand at the time. Maybe later they discovered what God's purpose was. How about King Hezekiah, for example? There's a guy who was sick. Isaiah 38, 1 tells us, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. The king is sick. And Isaiah tells him, get your, uh, get your earthly affairs in order because you're about to die. Now, that's not the news that anybody wants to hear. And so Hezekiah, he cries out to God asking him to spare his life. And what did God do? He answered that request, didn't he? He extended his life by 15 years. And God gave Isaiah a physical remedy for, for Hezekiah's sickness. In verse 21 of chapter 38 of Isaiah, he said, Let them take a lump of figs, lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. And so the testimony of Hezekiah reminds us that God is sovereign from the beginning of life, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, how God is in control of the beginning of life, when life begins. And that's his choice, and then he's also sovereign in the end of life. It's his choice when life ends. So even if we consume only the healthiest foods, we exercise proper, uh, properly, we're, we're careful uh, to rest and replenish and, and follow strict guidelines, you know, we still can't control how many days we have here on earth. That's not up to us. So you might as well just go ahead and eat pizza every day, right, Brother Denny? Interestingly, uh, thinking about pizza... Because it's one of the greatest foods of all time, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't like pizza? It's, a, it's got everything that you could want. As I was looking at these facts about, about turkey, I also found a, a link that, that linked over to pizza, and I couldn't help but click on that and look at it. Every second in the United States, 350 slices of pizza are eaten. Now, that's a lot of pizza per second, isn't it? That's 21,000 slices every minute. 21? Seems low. <laughs> now, that's just in the U.S. It's just in the U.S. Uh, you probably don't want to eat pizza every day. That's probably not a good way to steward your health. But if you do enjoy the occasional slice of pizza... You don't, have to, you don't have to feel too bad uh, because here's what, I, here's what I read. A typical daily pizza serving, it accounts for more than half of the lycopene needed in your diet. So pizza is actually healthy. We can eat pizza and say, you know what, I'm eating this for my health. In moderation, of course. If you, if you eat it in moderation, you only eat your serving. Uh, you know, lycopene, that's the, uh, that's the antioxidant it's, that has uh, been shown to help reduce the risk of cancer and heart disease. So, I mean, you are literally extending your life by eating pizza. That, that's, that's a great thing to find out. I, I was so happy when I read that. Here's the other thing that I read, if I can find it here. The average slice of pizza is 25% protein. That, if, you eat a, if you eat a slice of pizza, you get 35% of your recommended daily protein intake. So pizza's good for you. Eat more pizza. It's also been discovered uh, that pizza can lower the risk of esophageal cancer. Again, because of the, the tomato sauce. A study done by the International Journal of Cancer found that people who ate pizza at least once a week had less chance of developing cancer by 59%. It also, to the tomato sauce can help boost your immunity. So 
I mean, during this time of year when people get colds, don't eat an orange, eat another slice of pizza, right? <laughs> so maybe eating pizza every day is not the best way to steward our health. But if you eat the slice of pizza, you, you, know, you can know that, okay, I, I am doing something that's not just terrible for myself here. Uh, There's another story in Scripture that reminds us that that even in times of illness and disease, that God has a bigger purpose than sometimes we can immediately see. When Jesus was here on earth, he's walking with his disciples. You remember they encountered the man who'd been born blind? The man who'd been born blind. And what did the disciples immediately do when they saw this guy who had this, uh, this blindness? They immediately began looking for some reason why it had happened. John 9, verse number 2. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, this is a ridiculous question that they asked Jesus. What? Let's go back to verse number 2. Who sinned, his man or his parents, that he was born blind? I mean, how could this man's sin have caused him to be born blind at birth? I mean, this is foolish. And so Jesus explains to the disciples that God's purpose uh, in sickness or health, sometimes it's beyond our comprehension. Verse number three, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And then what did Jesus do? He healed the man, didn't he? He healed the man, gave him his sight back, and what was the end result? God was glorified because of this miracle. Now, if this blind man had spent years trying to figure out why he was blind, if he had been spending his entire life wallowing in self-pity over the fact that he had this condition. He would have just been frustrated. He would have been confused. He would have been angry. He could have been bitter. It was only later in his life that he found out what God's purpose in allowing this into his life was. There was no way he could understand this back at the time. And so as you seek in your life to apply God's principles... You may encounter things when it comes to your health that you don't understand why God has allowed this to happen. There were things in the life of Paul, health-wise, that Paul didn't understand. He wished that, that some of his health could have been different. But you remember what Paul said? God gave him his grace, and Paul understood that God would receive glory from Paul's life because of the illness he had. This man that we see here in the book of John. He comes to the point where now he can see that God was glorified because of his illness. In our lives, we may not understand why we deal with certain health issues, but God can get glory from those infirmities that we deal with. Because magnifying Christ... I think Paul would say this. And it's kind of a succinct way of saying what Paul said. That magnifying Christ in our lives is more important than feeling good. I I can just guarantee you that there were many days where Paul didn't feel good. But Paul understood that his life was designed to magnify Christ. And so we want to do all we can to steward our health so we have the greatest capacity we can to serve the Lord. And we just have to leave the unknown things, the unfixable things of our health up to God's providence and His sovereignty and trust that He has a plan. Now I want to look at Daniel because we talk about stewarding health. We see here in the very first book of Daniel, uh, his legacy. In our culture, it's, it's easily seen that... Our culture is very obsessed with food. Now, we all like to eat and we joke about it and all that kind of stuff. Food is good. But we are in a food-obsessed culture. 
And there's libraries written on the subject of health and diet and exercise. And those are all good things. Some of the stuff that you find, you know, there's, there's, there's gimmick diets and fad diets and there's solid research. I mean, you've just got a, a vast array of material out there. There's complicated diets. There's, there's health clubs that you can join. There's apps. I mean, there's everything when it comes to health. There's companion kits that you can buy. Some of the diets, you know, you have to buy all their material to be able to do the diet, all of these different things. But there's one thing that all diets seem to kind of have in common, and that is most of what we find when it comes to healthy eating and healthy living is that it all comes back to the Bible. The Bible kind of all had this figured out way back a long time ago, didn't it? If we look at the book of Daniel, we'll see that healthy eating is not complicated. Uh, what did Daniel do? Well, he ate a vegetable-rich diet, didn't he? Uh, Daniel, uh, he ate uh, lots of fiber. He followed the Levitical laws. You know the story of Daniel. He's taken captive as a young man from Israel, carried to Babylon, uh, and he's supposed to be educated in the ways of the Babylonians, and, and he's there for three years to serve in the palace. And there was a definite problem that Daniel encounters. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was required to eat the king's meat and the king's wine. Verse number 1. The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now, at first glance when we read this verse, uh, it would seem to be an ideal situation. I mean, the other captives from Israel that have been taken, they're not getting to eat the king's food. I mean, this is fantastic. But Daniel had a different perspective, didn't he? In verse number 8, I like this, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Now, why wouldn't Daniel eat this food? of the kings? Why was it? it? It was against what he had been taught. He, he knew this was in direct disobedience to God's commands. And so Daniel not only purposed not to eat the king's meat or drink his wine, but what did he do? He comes up, he says, let me, let me make another suggestion to you guys. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the units that he might not defile himself. Verse number 12, he says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Daniel chose to eat for nourishment rather than enjoyment in his life. He said, let's just have a simple uh, nutritional diet. I want to eat high fiber, uh, lots of vegetables, uh, no unclean animals, I'm going to follow the dietary laws in Leviticus. Now, we know that we're here in the age of grace. We don't follow the Levitical laws, and I'm glad for that because that means we can eat bacon every now and then, right? But we can see that there was some wisdom in what God chose for the people of Israel to eat. You can even go back to the Garden of Eden. I remember when I was a kid, my mom and dad, they did the uh, Hallelujah Diet. Uh, you guys may remember when they did that years ago. Uh, and this is a diet that goes back, let's eat the way that they did back in the Garden of Eden. And uh, so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of good things behind that. I mean, you can be healthy when you're doing it. I hated it when I was a kid because uh, we talked about this with all of my brothers and sisters yesterday because they, they were talking about how rough they had it and how easy I had it. I said, look, when you guys were kids, mom and dad weren't on the hallelujah diet. You didn't have to drink barley green every morning and fiber blend and eat and eat all of this other stuff. I'm the one who had to do that. That was when they, you know, they're starting to get a little older and so they get into this health kick. You guys didn't have to deal with that. So, you know, don't tell me how rough you had it. Um, so they went back and they, they did that for a long time, you know, and, and there's a lot of health benefits from it. God in his wisdom, he kind of had an idea of what people ought to eat. Well, here, 
uh, in Leviticus chapter 11, God gave a detailed classification of which animals could be it, uh, eaten. Uh, they could eat uh, cows and sheep and deer, stay away from uh, things like uh, pigs and camels and hares, you know, things like that. And uh, so many of the Old Testament laws, when it came to their diet, it was given uh, for the physical health and protection of God's people. And although the Israelites, they didn't understand back then all the reasons to avoid fat and all some of these other things that we have discovered now, but there's some wisdom in, in, in avoiding some of these foods, at least only consuming them in moderation, right? We're healthier if we'll follow that. So Daniel chose to eat for nourishment. But then secondly, he didn't just choose a simple diet. He had an intense hunger for God. He craved for God more than he did for food. Years after Daniel was taken to Babylon, there was a time when God gave him a special revelation of the future through a vision, which Daniel only partially understood. And so Daniel began to fast. He fasted for three straight weeks because he was seeking God. He wanted God and his power in his life to help him understand what he needed to understand. And so at that point, God became much more important to Daniel than food did. And so God delivered, in answer to Daniel's spiritual hunger, God delivered the wisdom that he needed. So the fact that Daniel fasted, he wasn't fasting uh, to try to avoid fat and cholesterol because he had type 2 diabetes, anything like that. His purpose in fasting was purely spiritual. And the definition of a scriptural fast is to restrict food for a spiritual purpose. And as we read through the Bible, we see many examples of this. There was Moses, Elijah, David, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, Esther, Anna, Jesus, Paul, Cornelius, church leaders, and elders in the book of Acts. From the Old Testament through the New Testament, we see people fasting. What these people were saying is, I'm not going to allow the lust of my flesh and the desire for food to control my life. More than anything in my life, I want God's power and God's direction and God's leading and God's blessing. Fasting years ago with Christians used to be a much more prevalent thing than it is today. Now, in the past couple of years, I have seen more and more of an emphasis placed back on fasting. But it might be that we've kind of forgotten the purpose behind it. When we fast, it allows us extra time to seek God. We don't have to worry about food, anything else. We can take those times, read scripture, pray, meditate. It's an outward expression of our inner hunger for God. And it can be a tough battle. And I'm not going to pretend to tell anybody when or how often they should fast. But I feel like reading through scripture, it seems like it's a very scriptural thing to do. And there should be times in our lives when we all fast. There's a fast called the Daniel fast that, that people do today. They follow Daniel's three weeks and they only eat certain items. There may be medical reasons or health conditions that would keep you from being able to fast. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to, to pray and, and ask God what you could give up in your life. Because there is ways that we can all fast. It may be giving up a specific food for a certain amount of time. Or a certain hobby. There are things that we can eliminate from our lives and say, I'm going to do without something for this amount of time and use this time instead to focus on God and ask for His power in my life. So in whatever way the Holy Spirit directs you, I would encourage you at some point to place an emphasis in your life on fasting and seeking God. It's not, again, it's one of those things that some people do as just a routine, kind of like checking off their Bible reading. Say, well, you know, every year I just fast and I've done my, I've done my thing. 
just having a ritual isn't a good reason for doing it. We know about rituals. That doesn't help us any. But I have experienced and seen other people experience God move in their lives through times of fasting. And Daniel's testimony concerning health and godliness, uh, it makes it obvious that in Daniel's life, food was not his God, was it? If we were painfully honest here in America, I don't know that we could say that. So many times it's what takes up most of our, our thoughts. Number three this morning as we finish out, let's learn some lessons from Elijah. We talk about wanting God's power in our life. There's not many people that could say that they have experienced God's power to the degree that Elijah did. Here he is on Mount Carmel. He calls down fire from heaven. He experiences one of the greatest victories in his life. But what's one of the things that we've established as we've studied Scripture when we come out of a great victory, a time of great uh, success in our life, we can easily plunge. We can find ourselves at rock bottom soon after. And that's exactly what happens to Elijah. He hits rock bottom here at the foot of Mount Carmel. Elijah uh, had heard that, that Jezebel the queen was seeking uh, retribution for his victory. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 1, we see it. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Well, that's not a very good message to get, is it? And when he saw that... He arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, that's shocking, isn't it? Or maybe it's familiar. He is in complete despair at this point in his life. We just watched this the other, the other night. This is the time of year when we always watch Charlie Brown stuff. Charlie Brown stuff's always on TV, and so we were watching Charlie Brown. Uh, and I remember this part. At one point, Charlie Brown is sharing his feelings with Lucy. And he, he says, I can't help it. I feel so lonely and so depressed. And Lucy says... This is ridiculous. You should be ashamed of yourself, Charlie Brown. You've got the whole world to live in. There's beauty all around you. There's things to do, great things to be accomplished. No man treads this earth alone. I mean, she's, she's really, uh, you know, charging Charlie Brown up. We are all together, one generation, taking up where the other generations left off. And Charlie, you know, he kind of gets his head up and he says, You're right, Lucy. You're right. You've made me see things differently. I realize now that, that I am a part of this world. I'm not alone. I have friends. Lucy says, name one. <laughs> hey, that's where Elijah was right here. I don't know if he could name one of his friends at this point. The culture that we live in, the, the speed at which we live today, it, we sometimes go at a speed that we cannot sustain indefinitely. You'll burn out. And when you combine spiritual warfare, which we know is something that takes place in the life of believers, especially Christians who are, who are making a difference for Christ, you're going to experience maybe even uh, more intense spiritual warfare than others. You combine all of those things together and you will begin to drain your resources. And so you have to have purposed, frequent replenishment. Here's Elijah. He is drained. He's just experienced a great victory for God. But Satan knows that's a good time to attack. 
And so when we find Elijah here in the wilderness under this juniper tree, he's so depleted, he's so discouraged, he's in such despair that, that he doesn't even know where to begin to replenish. He just says, God, I'm just going to die. But in God's gracious provision, through the next several verses, we see God's tender care. God, God's right there for Elijah. And through his provision for Elijah, he reveals how we can find replenishment that we need to serve for the long haul. Because we, we have to take a break every now and then. We'll find ourselves just like Elijah. And if you found yourself there, or if you're there right now, I'll tell you like Lucy did. Hold your head up. You've got friends. I don't know if you can name one, but you've got friends. What did Elijah discover here? Number one, he found solitude. He found solitude. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. For years, Elijah has invested himself in complete service to God, but he's, he's completely spent at this point. He has no more physical energy, no more spiritual energy, no more emotional energy. Everything is drained, and he needed some time to recuperate. Solitude should not be foreign to our vocabulary. When Jesus was here on earth, there were times where Jesus, his energy was spent and every time we see that happen, you'll read within a verse or two that Jesus, he got off alone. He found some solitude. Sometimes we just have to disengage. Sometimes we, have to, we just have to turn the phone off. We don't answer anybody. You can respond to text later. You can... Spend your two hours a day on social media like we talked about last week. You can catch on, up on that at another time. Sometimes we just need to unplug, disengage, and renew our hope and strength in the Lord because we can't sustain going at a breakneck pace without making solitude part of our routines. Secondly, take time to rest. Verse number 5 tells us that he lay and slept under a juniper tree. Verse number 6 said he laid down again. There was time for rest. Now that just sounds almost unspiritual and unscriptural to say, but right there it is. Elijah needed sleep. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. You ever been to that point where you just completely spent? You go down, you rest for a while, you take a nap. Your outlook's a little bit different when you wake back up and you're refreshed. You're not as grouchy then. People in your house can deal with you then. God built us with the need for sleep. And when we neglect that basic necessity and just go, 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 you'll find yourself feeling overwhelmed, defeated, so if you're running on substandard levels of sleep, God's got a prescription for you. Same one that he gave Elijah. Take a nap. Rest. And lastly, receive nourishment. When Elijah hit rock bottom, God uh, dealt kindly with this very weary, tired, defeated prophet. Elijah thinks, man, I'm permanently done thinking to the point that death is his best option. But what did he need? Well, he needed, a, he needed a nap, and he needed some food, some nourishment, something for his body to renew his strength. Verse number 5 tells us that an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked and beheld there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. He takes a nap, he eats, and he takes a nap again. That's what, that's what, that's what we do on Thanksgiving, right? <clears throat> you eat, take all of those carbs in, right? And then you go sleep somewhere. 
Then you get up and you go eat again. You do it all over, right? That's what we do at Thanksgiving. So this is good. you're getting your practice in here at, at the holiday time for what we need to do on a regular basis. Eat for nourishment. There's things that we can eat for our bodies that will help us to feel better. Our bodies need certain things more than, more than pizza every day and ice cream. And if we will eat for nourishment, we'll find that it will help to replenish our strength. So whatever measure of health we've been given, it's a gift from God. It's a limited resource. God calls us to steward it wisely. Because how we steward our health, what we can do for our health, is going to greatly impact what we can do with the rest of the resources that God gives us in living out our purpose for Him. So let's learn the lessons on health from the lives of two of these greatest prophets, Daniel and Elijah. Eat for nourishment rather than indulgence. Now don't feel bad here at the holiday time. Go ahead and eat that extra piece of fudge and you know, pumpkin pie or whatever. But for the majority of the time, eat for nourishment. Hunger for God and his power more than just fulfilling our physical appetites. And remember that we have to replenish. We have to do it on purpose. Sometimes we have to make ourselves do it. Or find somebody in your life, it may be your husband or your wife or another Christian friend, but have them hold you accountable to that and on purpose rest. So that way you're replenished. Bible tells in Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of scriptures might have hope. It has been given to us so we can learn from it. Next week, it's kind of in the same line. We're going to talk about stewarding our energy next week, how we can best manage that. It kind of goes hand in hand with these two, with these two subjects. Let's pray, and we'll take a, a, a short break. Lord, thank you so much for this Bible lesson here this morning on stewarding our health. We know that it's a gift from you. We don't control how long we're here on earth, but Lord, we know that you have a purpose for each of us and that we would do the best that we can to steward our health, manage it for your honor, for your glory. And Lord, that when we encounter uh, illnesses, diseases, that we may not understand why, we know that you have a greater purpose than we can see, that we would accept that and that we would live out our lives and that our sickness, our illness, our disease, that even our death, Lord, would bring honor and glory to you and that it would help serve your purpose here in the world. We pray that you'd meet with us now in this morning's service. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll take about a 10-minute break and meet back.